Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Colossians 1.28, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man complete in Christ Jesus. Some time ago, I believe back in 2019, I was asked to do a special study on law and grace. And I hesitated because in my mind, I just pretty much assumed that just about every verse by verse message that I was doing was in a sense surrounded by that subject. So now that we are out of Titus, I decided to look a little more closely at the subject of law and grace before moving on into a series of studies on biblical prophecy, given the year that we're now in with 2021 fastly approaching. So I'll begin by saying that I was just a little bit surprised at the request that, that I conduct this uh, study, since it seems to me that every teaching video that I've ever really done since teaching verse by verse is really a study of law and grace. And so about all I can do is sort of recap what I've seen throughout our studies in Romans, uh, uh, Ephesians, Colossians, Jude, and Titus. I think it's good that we start by defining terms. It's very, very important that we understand what we mean when we use certain words. It, the way I use words may not mean the same to you. You know, when I use words, it may not mean what you mean. When I use the word legalism, I mean it as a system, a code of regulations, which if disobeyed results in penalty. Legalism is an attitude of self-merit. It's of human merit based upon human actions and it, and it includes a penalty if the wrong actions are pursued or at least in the mind of the, the individual that, uh, that seems to be the case. Grace on the other hand is a word which is it's an attribute of God which led him to provide the complete basis of our redemption and our oneness with Him. It's an attribute that led Him to do this absolutely separate from anything in us. There was no merit. There was no activity. There was nothing, nothing in us. Nothing which led God to do that. This definition of grace is biblical. This definition of grace is, is truth. And it's absolutely unique to Christianity. And it should be clearly pointed out. And it should be clearly proclaimed. Legalism is the greatest enemy of the Christian church, folks. And it has been ever since the days of Christ. No other concept, no other concept is as devastating to biblical truth as the legalistic concept or the legalistic mindset. Now, I won't waste your time, but I could easily read 10 different statements from leading theologians today who say that we are still under God's law. And, and they say that, folks, in the very face of scriptural statements to the contrary. 10 of our leading theologians representing virtually a cross-section of, of theological thinking today in the United States and Europe, declare that we are still in one way or another under the law. Grace is the watershed of systematic theology. Grace is, the, is that concept which divides Christians. The Romanist approach to grace is that it's, it's mediated through a priest and through the sacraments. The Arminian concept of grace is that it's an attribute of God which cooperates with men. It requires man's cooperation. Otherwise, it's, it's, it, basically it's non-existent. The liberal view of grace is, is that man reaches a position of grace apart from any activity from God, that he does it all on his own. Grace, on the other hand, biblically, is that attribute which totally provides a complete basis upon which God can redeem us. I'm going to take you through the book of Galatians primarily, uh, and that rather quickly. Uh, 
However, my first reference, I, I'd like to cite John chapter 1, verse 17. The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. You all know the verse. If we look at it in the Greek, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came into being by means of Jesus Christ. And so one of the earliest references we have to the grace of God indicates that it is inseparable from the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Your authorized version says the grace and the truth came by Jesus Christ. The Greek says it came into being by means of Jesus Christ. And so the basis of all of our relationship to God is the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And Beavis, I guess, uh, the, our duck, doesn't like what I'm preaching here. So the question that is before us is not so much are we still under some, some of the law or all of the law, but what was the nature and the effect of the work Christ did for us? I believe it is absolutely apparent, even in the simplest of readings, that God has divided human history into at least three major time periods, each which, which begins with an event which actually transformed world history. There was, first of all, the age of law, when Israel was delivered from bondage in Egypt. Egypt was destroyed. It, it doesn't mean much to you because the modern newscaster on TV needs something up to date with, with which to shock you, but I believe that it, it was headline news when the armies of Egypt drowned in the Red Sea. Egypt was the world power, and Egypt was not the world power after God delivered the children of Israel from bondage in Egypt. It is very, very clear that that, that delivery was from bondage and that God absolutely provided for them. They were not out there uh, hoeing and raking the desert to raise potatoes and onions so that they could live. God absolutely provided for them. It wasn't God helps those who helps themselves. You know, you know, why is this Jew, why is this Israelite starving? You know, well, he's not gathering any, he's not gathering any water you know, so he can water his little patch of sand to raise some potatoes so he can live. You know, nobody did that, folks. And for 40 years, God absolutely provided for them separate from their effort. Are you hearing me? They couldn't raise anything. They couldn't drill any wells. They couldn't get any water. But they drank and they ate. There weren't no, there was no Walmarts. There was no Amazon. You know, but their shoes didn't wear out and their clothes didn't wear out. God did it. Okay? We have the age of law. The major definition of that period of human history was that if you do this, you'll be blessed. That age ended with the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The death burial, you know, of the Lord Jesus Christ and the resurrection of of Christ was a world transforming, a history transforming event. If you don't think so, then really you're not thinking. A history transforming event. When you just mention the date, you, you mentioned the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We divided history into that which was before Christ and that which is after Christ. And we are in the year of our Lord 2020. And if we insist that there's no Lord and there's no God, well, we're still tied to the world transforming event, which says 2020 is the year of our Lord. 2020. So, with the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord came the second major period of human history, that period which God calls grace. This period can most easily be characterized as since you've been so totally blessed, then go and do. Under law, if you did, you were blessed. If you didn't, well, you paid a penalty. Under grace, you have been totally blessed. We've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. For any of you who believes that by doing something, God will bless you more, 
you are faced with a statement of Scripture that He has blessed you with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. He's already done that. He can't bless you any more than He has. So our concept is, is since we've been totally blessed, we go forth and we do. But if we don't do, there's no penalty. Grace begins with total blessing and it ends with no penalty. And it, it is unique. It is a unique period in human history. The kingdom age which is to come is not the age of grace. The age in which you and I are now living where God has, has deemed it wise to show the greatness of His grace in redeeming us totally separate from law or self. The kingdom age is the third major period of human history and it begins with a world transforming event, the return of Christ, the war of Armageddon, and the establishment of His earthly rule. Under the period of law, there were laws given which were perfect, but no power given to keep them. Under the period of grace, there are no laws given. We're not under law, but there is given total power, total ability, total enablement because, because we are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. In the kingdom age, the law will be reestablished, but it will be reestablished with enablement. I will write my laws upon their hearts and I will put them in their minds. It just happens that you and I, by God's design, have been born into that period of time where there is no law, no regulation, no penalty, and, and total enablement. We are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. It is impossible in any study of the Word of God to establish any way in which you could lose the Holy Spirit or that in any way he, that the Holy Spirit would depart from you. In the fourth verse of Galatians 2, we find that the law brings us into bondage. Anybody who is teaching legalism today, and let me tell you, that's over 95% of all the churches who gathered to meet this week in one way or another, they are enslaving, they are putting in bondage the Christian. You know, you people haven't given enough. You haven't sacrificed enough. You haven't led enough souls to Christ. And, you know, and that, and, you know that's going to put me under some bondage because I don't know if I've ever saved any, anybody. And, I, and I'm getting to the age where you apply for Social Security and you look forward to death, if not the rapture. If I haven't saved anybody now, I'm, I'm in real trouble. Most of Christianity today is dedicated in one way or another to burden the hearer, the listener, so that he'll do more. That is absolutely a violation of grace. They came in privately to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage. The law is slavery. That's the first thing that I want you to realize. Legalism, folks, enslaves. The recipient is now the slave of human performance and of human merit. Look at the 16th verse of Galatians chapter 2. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. The word know there is a perfect active participle. We know. We absolutely now know. We've known it in past time with the result that we in internally know that a man cannot be justified by means of the works of the law, but by means of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Therefore, the law can't show one person to be righteous. Modern Christianity is involved in... Idol worship, folks. Idol worship. That idol being free will and man's ability, man's sovereign will, sovereign over God. The 19th verse of the second chapter, For I through the law am dead to the law in order that I might live unto God. It, it, is, a, it is a very important concept for you to comprehend. 
The legalist says if you live well unto God, you'll attend church Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and, and, and if you're really spiritual, Wednesday night, and that's a problem with this fellowship. We don't meet at all. In fact, we hardly know one another at all. So we can't be spiritual, I guess, you know, which is... You know, which is why I try and present three messages a week since most churches have three services a week. And I consider Blessed Hope Forever to be an online church. So perhaps we are spiritual after all. And folks, that's the devastating side effect of legalism. Here you are, one redeemed by the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are absolutely unable to live unto God unless you have died to the law. Oh, man, to understand that concept is so desperately important. You know, if I gave most Christians that, that I know a handbook that said that you know, these are the, the things that good Christians do and these are the things that good Christians shouldn't do, they'd spend all their time looking at that, at that book and not looking at Christ. If I don't die to the law, folks, I cannot live unto God. What a terrible thought to walk through life unable to live unto the God who made me righteous. Look at the 21st verse of the second chapter of Galatians. I do not frustrate the grace of God. Now that's, that's my authorized version. The Greek says, I do not set aside God's grace, for if righteousness is through law, then Christ died for nothing. So if I go back to legalism, I set the grace... of Aside, I set aside the grace of God. The very thing that the legalist says I'm not doing is what I'm doing. I am replacing the grace of God with the human merit system. If your life is lived by the do's and don'ts, you're in the merit system, folks. If I live by the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's in the grace system. My Bible says, if I go to the legalistic system, I set aside God's grace. We read a little bit later on, you're falling from grace. Falling from grace is falling into legalism. Look at the fifth verse, the fifth verse of chapter 3. He therefore that ministers to you the Spirit and works miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law. And the anticipated answer is, is no. Or does he do it by the hearing of faith? And the answer is yes. And what I want you to see is that legalism does not minister the Spirit. The very thing that I need, I cannot get from legalism. Because I've dropped from the realm of the Spirit to the realm of the flesh. Look at the 10th verse of the 3rd chapter. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So if I have fallen back to the legalistic system, I'm now under the curse. What a, what a horrible thought. Me for whom there is no curse have by my own choice, my own volition, decided that I'd prefer to walk under the curse. The law, legalism, places us under a curse. Look at the 12th verse. The law is not of faith. Legalism, which is an outgrowth of law, cannot come from trust or faith or human merit. So that legalistic attitude is not from faith. Look at verse 18 of chapter 3. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. Well, if I go back to a legalistic system, I have no inheritance. Now, Esau didn't want this. Esau sold his birthright. He didn't want his inheritance. And surely, folks, the account makes it clear that that wasn't an honorable thing to do. What he said was, I don't care what my dad has destined for me. I don't want it. That's what legalism says. It provides no inheritance. Look at the 21st verse. The 21st verse is, is devastating. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. 
Clearly, folks, you can't read that statement other than agreeing that the law and legalism that is an outgrowth of the law cannot, cannot, cannot give life. Why should I walk among the dead when I'm alive in Christ? It cannot give life. Look at the 23rd verse. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up from the faith which should afterwards be revealed. The law and legalism which stems from the law shuts us up from God. It, it imprisons us. It, it puts us in jail. We who have been set free decide that it would be better for us to be back in jail. You know, shut up unto the faithfulness which should afterwards be revealed. And so the law guards us. It bars us. It seals us from the faithfulness of God. The 24th verse, Wherefore the law was our child trainer until Christ came that we might be justified out of that faith. Therefore the law is immature. It's not only immature in the 24th verse of the 3rd chapter, it's immature in the 1st through the 4th verses of the 4th chapter. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law. So legalism is immature. We have the same thing in the ninth verse of the eighth chapter of Hebrews. When I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. The concept in that verse is not that I dragged them force, you know, by force, but I led them as a father leads a child. And so we see the immaturity of the legalistic system. The third verse of the fourth chapter. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. If the elements of the world bothers you because the Christian mind has been conditioned to believe that the world you know, is rock music, painted toenails, movies, dancing, you know, drinking, smoking, God knows what. But that is not a biblical definition. We were in bondage under the elements of the world. The world religious system. Verse 5, to redeem them that were in bondage under the law. The world system is the legal system, the legalistic system. And so it keeps us in bondage, folks. Legalism binds us. It binds us up. It doesn't set us free. It can't set us free. The ninth verse, but now after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage. Back to that which is weak and that which is beggarly. You know, that weak and poor beggarly means poor. This is not the only verse where we know the weakness of the law. Romans 8, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did, and so the law is weak. Legalism stemming from the law is weak and poor. What a choice to make when we're children of the King. And I could go on and on presenting verse after verse where we see the heart of God toward us concerning the matter of law and grace. In every single epistle that I've, I've gone through with you people, verse by verse, there is not one chapter that doesn't address this issue of law versus grace. Not a single one. Not a single one. Not just in John, Galatians, Hebrews. It's, it's, on, it's on every thin page of Scripture, folks. Legalism nullifies the work of Christ. Any attempt, any attempt to please God by human merit reduces to zero the finished work of Jesus Christ. If there's anything added to the finished work of Christ, the finished work of Christ equals zero. If that's not clear to you, then the problem is in my way of explaining it, which means I've failed to explain it in, in well over a hundred, well, hundreds of videos. 
Legalism, any basis of human merit, reduces to nothing, zero, the finished work of Jesus Christ. If you say eternal life equals the finished work of Christ plus clipping your toenails, you, you, you wouldn't have eternal life. Therefore, that ought to be clear to everybody. Christ profits you nothing. If there's legalism involved, any human merit nullifies the work of Christ. I didn't say this. I didn't say this, folks. God did. My Bible doesn't say anything different than yours. Galatians chapter 5, verses 2 and 3 and 4. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. If we look at the... the uh, 18th verse through the 26th verse of chapter 5 in Galatians we suddenly see in verse 18 that the Spirit cannot lead you if you are under law if you are operating your life under any code of regulations any legalism which stems from rules and regulations then you can't be led by the Spirit because the 18th verse clearly says that if you are led of the Spirit then you're not under any of those things. And now it begins in the 19th verse to tell you what the sphere of law is. Most people look at 19 through 21 as saying, these are the things that I shouldn't do, when what the Holy Spirit is saying is this is where law works. This is where legalism works. Law cannot function in the sphere of the Spirit. Devastating that we'd take that which we thought was good when it's really destroying us. There's thousands of, of God's people who are absolutely redeemed from any element of, of human merit who are killing themselves in their fellowship with God doing that. Doing that which, which, they, which they think is good for them and it, and it, and it doesn't. The devil loves to get you know, as they say, the devil's in the details. The devil loves to get us back in the area of legalism. And the devil always says, that's a good area. That's a good area. That, that's an area that will keep you from sin. When the truth is, it does just the opposite. We know from Scripture that the law is the strength of sin. The 26th verse is saying that legalism leads to exaltation of self. The very, the very thing the legalist says it doesn't do is the thing that it, do, it does. And God points it out. It exalts self. It leads to corruption. Galatians 6, 8, we are crucified to it. Therefore, well, look at 6, 14. It makes nothing perfect. Hebrews 7.19, it's inferior. It's an inferior covenant. It's not a superior, it's an inferior. Hebrews 8.6, it's weak. Hebrews 8.7, it allows us no standing before God. Hebrews 9.8, it's an area of... Or, or Hebrews 9.14, it cannot put away sin. Hebrews 9.26, it's not real, it's only a shadow. How, folks, how have we strayed so far from the truth? Hebrews 10.1, it leads us to remember sin. That's what legalism does. It keeps our remembrance on sin when God says, I remember no more. Hebrews 10.6 and 8, it's not well pleasing to God. He has no pleasure in sacrificial offerings. He has no pleasure in your human merit offering. It's an abomination to Him, folks. Because His Son was the ultimate sacrifice, the only sacrifice. He's not looking for sacrificial offerings of self. I mean, are you kidding me? Come on. I mean, think, folks. And that's what legalism is.
He has no pleasure. God has no pleasure in your human merit offering. They are distasteful. They're a stench to Him. It, and, and folks, these truths, they are, they're all woven through the Word like a golden thread. And I've presented you only with, with 30, give or take, Scriptures on this subject. When there are literally hundreds, hundreds, the truth of God's Word today is suffering from a lack of interest by those for, for whom it was given. I want to thank you all for uh, following us along as we move forward toward the end of all things here with BlessedHopeForever.com. I want to thank you for all your messages and encouragement and support. We ask for your continued prayers for direction. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching. Father, we're, we are thankful, so very thankful for all that you've done for us. We're thankful for the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we stand complete before you, that you have presented us holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in your sight, that you have removed our sins as far as the east is from the west, cast them behind your back, bury them in the deepest sea and even though they're sought for they cannot be found washed as white as snow and you'll remember them no more how great is the grace of our god thank you father for allowing us to feast together on your word we give you all the glory honor and praise in christ's name i pray amen